computer and I will share this. Any questions about the science so far? Okay, you, 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 have, you have all been very active on the, not all, 60% of you have been quite active on the Slack, so that's, that's wonderful. And I hope you can, you follow the discussions that go on on Slack, even if you are not a part of them, but if others are discussing something, hopefully you can still benefit from that. And the other thing you might be able to use Slack from is to set up uh, some meeting groups to work on the homeworks together. You know, if you want to announce on the, we can, we can make a channel for that or whatever, or just in general, you can announce that some of us are going to get together on Zoom and work on this homework. And, uh, and you can group in whichever ways you want to group. You don't want the groups to be too big, but you know, try to create a real experience as much as we can. Okay, great. So today we will start our discussion of the first law of thermodynamics, which is really the core of this class. You know, there is a zeroth law, we will get to that later, but essentially first law and second law of thermodynamics form the core of this class. And in some form or the other, you must have seen first law of thermodynamics before. So, but today we are going to look at it from a quite a fundamental perspective. This is not as fundamental of a perspective as it can be on the website. I gave a link to Neuther's theorem related to Emily or Emma, Emma Neuther, who was one of the most amazing mathematicians. She had to write letters to Gauss as a man because 200 years ago or whenever it was not uh, considered proper for women to be mathematician. But Neuther's theorem talks about symmetries in physical systems. And essentially, first law of thermodynamics falls out of that, like most conservation laws. So, so today we will start to talk about first law of thermodynamics. And we will be introducing a few terms. Again, these are terms that we use casually. We will introduce them in a very systematic framework. So the first thing, so what is first law of thermodynamics? It is really understanding the relation between heat, work, and energy. How do these three connect to each other? That's what first law of thermodynamics is about. What's the connection between this? So first we need to understand what is heat, what is work, how are they different from each other? What are they different? And uh, even before that, we have to understand a concept of system and surroundings. These are terms that will be coming up again and again, and it's good to be slightly rigorous about what they mean. So what do we mean by a system? System is a part of the world that we are interested in. It could be an engine that you're trying to study. It could be a box in which a reaction is going on, or it could be a cell, a biology, biological cell. So system is the part of the world that we want to study. Example, a vessel, a cell, an engine, anything like that. Surroundings, once you have defined the system, surroundings are easy. Surroundings are everything else. Anything that you have not considered in the system is a part of your surrounding. So, and you can, your system can be more generic. The whole universe can be a system. In that case, there is no surrounding. Everything is gone. There is nothing to consider. So that's how we define systems and surroundings. And this distinction is very subtle. It's, it's not subtle. It's, the distinction is simple, but it's, it's got huge implications, when, especially when we get to second law of thermodynamics and stuff. We will talk about how, for example, second law of thermodynamics can be misused to talk about why evolution is not correct and things like that and why that argument does not hold true because people don't really understand the difference between system and surrounding. So it has huge implications, not just for PCAM, but for really life and scientific policy and things like that, this distinction. But for now, let's see what are the types of system that one might have. So, and by the way, I'm mostly following Atkins, at least in structure. So this is our topic two, I think, in Atkins, if you want to read. But you can get this material out of any book. So there is nothing particularly special about Atkins. <clears throat> so there are three types of system that we are considering. Uh, considering. The first one is an isolated system. What do we mean by isolated system? It means 
Nothing can go in or out this system. No heat, no mass. Neither heat nor mass can enter or escape, can transfer through the boundaries of the system. The second type of system we are going to consider is a slightly more relaxed version of the isolated system. In this case, we will allow energy, uh -uh. we will allow energy to increase, uh, change out of the system. Mass cannot go, but it can cool, heat, and all those things. So this one is called a closed system, and only, only heat or thermal energy can escape the system. So this is our closed system. And the third system is what we call an open system, in which case the best way to denote it is to make uh, dashes inside your boundaries. And in this case, you have heat that can go inside and outside the system, but also matter can go inside and outside the system. So, you can imagine, for example, the middle one, the closed system is some sort of a membrane which does not allow anything to escape. While this one is a membrane with large holes and it can exchange heat and uh, energy, and, uh, but also mass. This is something on Slack. Slack. What does it mean? What does it say below the isolated system? It says uh, neither heat nor mass can transfer. Don't worry about too much about things that you don't get in your notes below anything. Just make a mark and later go in the video and play through it. It's on YouTube. You can also quadruple the speed or double the speed. You will get that quickly. So don't worry too much about these things. And uh, this one is neither. Uh, sorry, I wrote it opposite. Everything. So mechanical and thermal energy can escape the system. So these are the three types of systems that we are going to be uh, studying. So, so the key difference you can see between all these three systems is that the isolated system does not interact with its surroundings, while the closed system and the open system do interact with their surroundings. It is, so the distinction between work and heat comes from understanding what is the nature of this interaction. So interaction between system and surrounding can be work or can be heat. So in next class, I think we will be talking about the different types of work. When I say work, it also means not just work as in expanding a system, but also chemical work by actually driving matter in and out of the system. So there are different types of work that can be. For now, we will mostly think about, yeah, we will get to different types of work. Can there be a system where mass can be transferred, but not heat? Huh? I don't think so. Because think about it, when you're transferring mass, unless you manage to transfer the mass with zero velocity, you are giving heat to the system. What is heat, right? Heat comes from fluctuations, from movements of the atoms. So anytime you are transferring mass to a system, you, you have motion. If you have motion, you're transferring heat. So my answer is no, you're, it's, it's not going to happen that way, but that's a good question. So the interaction between the system and surrounding can be work on heat. The common feature between both of them is that they both, lead to increase in energy of the system. They are different and we will get just in a moment as to what is the difference between them. But the common thing is that they both lead to change in actually what is called the internal energy of a system. So if you're inside a system, you won't be able to tell whether work was done upon you or heat was given to you. Your only observation will be that your internal energy went up or down. However, work and heat are different. So what is the difference between work and heat? Heat is the transfer of energy between system and surroundings that makes use of random motion. 
in the surrounding. So let's look at this. So we have we have a system through which let's say this is our system, and we are going to consider two cases side by side. So in both cases, this, this part is our system, the bottom part, okay? And this part is our surrounding. I just wrote surround, but it means surrounding. So here we are going to explain what is heat and here we are going to explain what is water. The idea in heat is that these atoms that are in the surrounding are also moving, right? You have some sort of gas or whatever liquid or whatever, and these things, are in constant motion. You could have a kinetic model like we did where you assumed ideal gas and they could be in ideal gas type of motion, but there could be some complicated motion where they're colliding with each other, a bunch of stuff like that. So heat is the transfer of energy that happens due to this random motion in the surroundings. So I can write it down here. Heat Heat is transfer of energy that comes due to random molecular motion in the surroundings. So what is the source of this randomness? Remember, we spent some time thinking about the Vx probability distribution and everything. So things are always moving in a random manner. And once in a while, they will collide with the system atoms at this interface right over here. Once they do that, they will transfer some energy into the system. And that is our heat. Work, on the other hand, is when you take these atoms and you move them in a very directed manner, there is the randomness is replaced by some sort of very directed predetermined motion. So my arrow looks up and down in both cases, but notice that here the source of energy is this thermal motion, which is handling and happening in random move in random direction. But in this case, you are forcing the movement to happen only in one direction. So heat, so work, unlike heat, Work is transfer of energy making use of organized motion. That's the difference between both of them. So you have a system, let's imagine a test tube in the bottom of it is the system that you're considering. And if you just pump heat into the top of the, if, if you just increase the temperature of the top molecules, they are going to transfer some of the heat to the bottom molecules, right? And that will do something to the bottom molecules. But in addition to that, you could also take these top molecules and start to compress them gradually, right? And then also you're doing uh, organized, then also you're transferring something to the system, but now it's very organized. It's all moving in one direction. Actually, both are happening at the same time. You have heat contributing to something in the system. You have internal energy, uh, you have work contributing to something to the system. So the thing to keep in mind regarding heat and work is heat is random. That's the keyword here, while work comes due to organized motion. Yeah, so do they both lead to increase in internal energy? Daisy asks if they both lead to increase in internal energy. Well, no, it could be increase or decrease, but decrease is just increase with a minus sign, right? So I'm just, I didn't want to write too much. So that's the point. And we will see what it means. We will be very mathematical just in a moment. So what is internal energy? Before we go into what heat and work do to the internal energy of the system, first we have to think about what is this internal energy that we are talking about. So. Internal energy, it is typically, oh, by the way, I should also write down that heat is typically denoted by the symbol Q and work is typically denoted by the system uh, symbol W. Internal energy is 
denoted by the symbol U. This is the total kinetic energy, Ke, plus potential energy, Pe, of the constituents of the system, not the surrounding, only the system of the constituents of the system. So the system is made up of atoms, molecules, whatever, some liquid. You take all their kinetic energy, you take all their potential energy, you add it up. Elizabeth asks, does heat involve the intermixing of molecules from the surrounding and system, or is it due to proximity? It's due to proximity because it could be due to intermixing, but then we are not just talking about a closed system, right? If you had actual intermixing of molecules, then you will need to have an open system for that to happen. So heat can happen due to intermixing, like in this open system over here, but the basic form is just this, uh, it's like, uh, you know, it's like being in an airplane and uh, uh, crying baby is in the seat in front of you. In order to irritate you, you really don't need to take the baby in your hand, right? The baby can cry, 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 cry and irritate you. It doesn't have to be a baby. It could be someone who is upset in any way. So, you know, you could have some interaction even without mass transferring. If mass transferred, of course, there would be more, uh, there could still be heat, but this uh, movement of mass is not, it, it will help, but it's not needed. Okay, so this internal energy comes from the sum of kinetic energy and potential energy of the constituents. One thing to keep in mind, and this is where some of the physics comes in, it does not really arise from the motion of the surrounding. So if you, if you are sitting in a car and you're moving, you have to be careful in how you define the internal energy. It depends on all about the system. If you are moving inside a car and the car is also moving and the system is you plus the car, then the internal energy, of course, takes into account your speed that goes, that, that the car also has, right? Uh, but if the car is your system, then in that frame of reference, you are stationary and your internal energy is, uh, is, is, is not coming from the speed of the car. So the one thing to keep in mind here is keep frame of reference or system definition in mind before defining it. So next time you're doing an experiment on some molecule and someone asks you to calculate the internal energy of the system, you will go like, oh, in PKM481, I was taught by Professor Tiwari that internal energy comes from the kinetic energy of the atoms and we are on earth, we are moving around the sun, so we have a lot of kinetic energy and I should consider that term also. But not really, when you're doing this system, uh, this experiment on your system, you have defined all that motion in the surrounding part. So you don't consider that. So one very interesting thing in thermodynamics is that we are rarely concerned with the value of the internal energy itself. Almost entirely, we are concerned with the change in internal energy. It's very rare that we talk about what is U for a particular system, we are almost always interested in delta U. And now begins your adventure with calculus. From this point onward, this course will grow and grow in calculus, especially multivariable calculus. Keep working on it. If you have taken Calc 3 and did not like it, you have to do work. If you have never taken Calc 3, I'm really sorry that Calc 3 is not a mandatory class for PCAM 481. I have been arguing about it with the other faculty. And other faculty have also been arguing it somehow didn't happen. It should be, but we are there to help you ask questions on Slack. And those of you who like Calc 3, who understand it, please take time to help your classmates out. There is only so much I can answer or Connor can answer, but you can help your classmates out. And if, if you understand multivariable calculus, I remember it took me a while to get comfortable with it. Calculus is hard enough. Multivariable calculus is a bit funky. It takes time to get adjusted to it, but when you do, it's really quite easy. That's the only thing I can tell you. It's all about thinking what variables are to be treated as constants. So it takes some work, it's worth it. Find exercise solutions, not just the ones exercises that not just I have given, but there are lots and lots of them on the internet. Try to do them yourself and you will know yourself whether you feel confident in it or not. So here we are interested in change in delta U and change in energy, which is called delta U. What does it mean? It means that you have a process that takes you from some initial state I 
to some final state f. So i is some initial state, and f is some final state. I think your screen is frozen. Oh yeah, it happens in new iPad. Ugh. Someone advised that I should uh, use a wire to connect, but the problem with that is sometimes I get so excited while teaching that I will, I will, I will just like cause an explosion here. Okay, cool. Thanks for pointing that out. So we are interested in some initial state going to some final state. At this point, you should object as to where are these two points lying. I'm talking about some coordinate space where, for example, I'm going from one value of volume and pressure. Let's say I have pressure on the y-axis and volume on the uh, x-axis. And let's say I'm going from some point i to some point f. Okay, just like we, you do in the first problem in the homework, uh, first problem in the homework set. So delta u is defined as u f minus u i. It is the final minus initial. This difference is very important. All of what we are going to do next can be done if you define delta u as initial minus final, but signs will change. So be careful that we have defined it as final minus initial. The most wonderful thing about u is that irrespective of the path you take, delta u is going to be independent. So we have these four different paths. Let's call them path one, path two, path three, path four. Delta u does not depend on path. And such variables have a very special name in thermodynamics. They are called state functions. It is a function only of the state. Now we know what are the variables of state, right? The variables of state are pressure, uh, pressure, volume, temperature, and number. We also know that only three of these suffice, right? This is something which might seem like very trivial part of the beginning part of this class that, oh, that is so obvious, but it is something many students tend to forget that given four variables of state, only three are sufficient. So the thing about internal energy is that it depends on only three of the variables. And given these three variables, you can specify the internal energy of the system exactly. If you know the value of T, V, N, or if you know the value of T, V, P, or if you know the value of N, V, T, so on and so forth, there is nothing stopping you from exactly specifying the value of the internal energy, etc. So here I drew a two dimensional uh, figure. I could imagine a third axis. So I drew something over here. Let's say that is, let's say we are interested in this one. So PVT. So this initial point corresponds to some value of PVT. This final point corresponds to some value of PVT. The reason why it is a state function is because U depends on only the variable of states. So if you are at UI, you can write down, it's going to be U of TI, VI, PI. If you are at UF, it's going to be U of TF, VF, PF. And the difference between both of these has nothing to do with how you actually took the system from point, one, point I to point F. You could take any path you care for. All that matters is that the endpoints have very well-defined values depending on where they are located. So I want to make a subtle point here that we are going to revisit later. Let me find the correct expression for that before uh, any questions about this material as I look for this? No questions? Okay. So let me look up what I wanted to say. Yeah, so notice here that I wrote down that U can be written as a function of TVN, T, 
TVP or NVT. All of these are correct. However, not all of these are the natural ways to do this. Later, we will study about natural variables. It just so happens that there is a very special way of using which three variables to introduce in U that plays a strong role in how thermodynamics is set up. Before doing that, we will have to talk about entropy. It's later because the key to doing that is to understand that entropy is the natural variables for entropy are number, volume, and U. If it doesn't make sense right now, that's okay, but we are going to revisit this later. And this is actually a statement of the second law of thermodynamics that the entropy can be written this way. From this, we will be able to tell which of these is a more natural way to denote internal energy. So all three of them are correct, but if most of them lead to some sort of information loss, and which, which is a very interesting concept, and we'll get to that later. But for now, let's just focus on the fact that Given three coordinates, you can write the internal energy solely as a function of these three coordinates. That's wonderful because when you go from coordinate A to coordinate B, it doesn't matter what's the path you took, the internal energy change is always going to be the same. Not all functions are like this. We also have path functions. And we already saw two path functions, Q and W. The heat that you give to a system or the work that you do on a system depends on the path that you took. And uh, should I talk about the internal energy examples first? No, I want to just introduce you to second law of uh, first law of thermodynamics and then we will go to looking at internal energy from a more uh, detailed perspective. It's not blurry on my screen, so that's, that's surprising. Okay, so, <clears throat> so the heat that you give to a system or the work that you perform on a system very much depend on the path that you take. So let's take an example. I am sitting in this room, you are sitting in the room that you are in currently, and you have to go to the room above you, right? There are different paths that you can take. You can walk up the stairs, you can go outside, climb a tree, and then can take to the room upstairs, or you can just try to be like Superman and bang your head through the ceiling and try to get to the floor above. All three of them will involve different amounts of heat that you take from the system, right? If you go up the tree, you're probably gonna get a bit sweaty. If you go up the stairs, Depending on how fit you are, you'll probably not get fit, uh, sweaty. And if you try to bang your head through the floor, you will definitely, there will be a lot of heat transfer that happens, right? So the, here, what is the system? Here, the system is you. Surrounding is everything else. So the surrounding does different amounts of heat transfer to you. And also the work done here is the work done against gravity, right? So if you go up the stairs, you are gradually going up. If you go up the trees, you are steeply going up. If you go straight through the ceiling, then also you are steeply going up. So in both, in all three cases, the heat and the work are very, very different. Which means that the change in going from point I to F in general, so now I'm immediately going from this intuitive, hopefully example of you going through the roof, to a more generic example, depends on the path. Just because you are sitting here and 10 minutes later you are sitting upstairs does not tell us what was the heat transfer during this process that took you from downstairs to upstairs. Similarly, delta W, point I to F, depends on the path. So <clears throat> this leads us to the first law of thermodynamics, which is beautiful. It says that even though delta Q is a path function, which really, so delta Q will be different. So this one will have a delta Q1. This will have a delta Q2. This will have a delta Q3. This will have a delta Q4. And similarly, you will have a delta W1, delta W2, delta- I think my screen froze again. No, I'm just writing tiny. 
in the figure. Oh, okay. You see my hello and my face? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's me. I'm, I'm a terrible drawer. Whatever. So delta Q depends on the path that you take. Delta W depends on the path that you take. However, the most amazing thing is, if you add these two up, then independent of the path that you took, they are always path independent. So this is a path function. This is a path function. But lo and behold, their sum is a state function. That's kind of incredible, right? I think it's amazing that it happens to be this way. This is our first law of thermodynamics that the sum of the heat given to a system, even though it depends on the path you took, the sum of the work done on a system, even though it depends on the work, the path you took, their sum, however, is going to be equal to the same thing if the starting point and the ending point are the same. We can write it in a differential form. So this is when you did a large change. You went from some point I to some point F, which is very far off, right? But you could Im imagine a smaller axis that looks like this. And let's say you just move from here to here. So this is P and V. And you did a small change, very tiny change. In that case, we will be talking about differential change in U, right? So that is DU. And notice I use the small letter D over here. Since it's so important, let me write it uh, cleanly. So we have DU. For Q and W, we cannot write D. We have to use a special symbol, which we'll either write as delta. Now, uh, I, I will just use the capital Q. But I might, I will probably end up using small Q instead of capital Q. The idea is the same. Another way of writing this equivalent way is to write D with a cut, DQ plus DW. So these are all our first law of thermodynamics. The delta here indicates that Q and W are inexact differentials. Inexact differentials come from path functions, while u over here is an exact differential, which comes from a state function. And that's why I've been rambling so much about calc three and state functions and path functions and things like that. So it plays a very crucial role in all of this. And the most amazing thing is that if you are the system, you can't tell whether you gained energy due to heat being done on you or due to work being done on you. You can't tell. From your perspective, all that happened is that you changed your uh, internal energy. That is the only thing that happens for you. You cannot tell whether it was heat or work. So if you're in the system over here, if, if this is you, you simply are unable to tell. You will look exactly the same, whether it's heat or work. From your perspective, you cannot tell whether the motion that led to your internal energy increase or decrease was random motion or organized motion, whether it was heat or whether it was work, you cannot tell the difference. And that is the essence of the first law of thermodynamics. Are all state functions a sum of path functions or this one just in particular? That's a profound question. There might be, there is no Nobel Prize in math, there is an Abel Prize, there is a Fields Medal, you might win one of those. I, th I think that's a profound question. I don't know the answer. You should look it up and tell me. I can, however, tell you this. Not all sums of path functions become state functions, right? Just because you have two path functions and you add them, you won't get a state function. Any, anyone wants to give me an example of when this might be true? Can, does anyone want me to give an example? Let's write it down. Of... path function one plus path function two not equal to state function. We just saw that 
Also, another thing to keep in mind is that we are not talking about just the path function. We are talking about the change in the path function. Okay, that's quite important because there is no point in talking about a path function. You're moving from point A to point B. Okay, good. So does anyone want me to give an example of such a case? Can you think of one given what we have studied so far? Where this might be true? Be, be brave, be creative, don't be shy. No one's judging you. Yeah, who is it? Who wants to try? I'm seeing Lucas on my Zoom, so I'm just gonna pick up Lucas. Lucas, you wanna try and tell me if you can think of an example? Um, I can't think of an example, so. Okay, let's work through this, let's work through this. Stay with me, Lucas, okay? We just saw that delta Q plus delta W is delta U, correct? So in this case, sum of two path functions is a state function. How about delta Q plus two delta Q? Isn't two delta Q a path function? Yes. It's a trivial example. I just constructed a trivial example. This is not going to be a state function. Right? So you can imagine other path functions that follow properties like this. Okay, good. Well, you showed up on my Zoom, so I thought I should ask you. <laughs> good, thanks, Lucas, I appreciate it. So, <clears throat> so this is the essence of first law of thermodynamics, that you have two path functions, their sum is a state function. This is nothing but a statement of conservation of energy. The energy stays conserved. That's what it falls from. And that, hence the connection with Emily Neuther's Neuther's theorem that you can go and read about. There's no way we are going to talk about that in class today. So we have now talked about first law of thermodynamics, which tells us, so this was a detour. If someone gets, there's some of you who are not on Zoom and you might get confused later as to what Paul are rambling about here, it's just a detour. But the thing to keep in mind is that we have just seen that du is equal to delta Q plus delta W. DU is equal to, so, and you can never write DQ. If in a homework or in an exam, you write DQ without this cut, if you just write it as, let me specify it on the, DQ or DW is incorrect. We cannot write that. If you write that, you will lose points, period. No questions asked. It always has to be like this or, Like this. So what does it mean? It means that let's say if you are given a function that looks like, let's say we are interested in changes, let me try to connect it to the first homework in pressure volume space, right? This could be pressure volume temperature. And you are given a function that looks like APV BP plus BPV, BA is a function of P and V and B is a function of P and V multiplied by DV. And someone tells you, is this an exact differential or not? You would go and do your Euler's test, right? You would go and check, differentiate A with respect to B, differentiate B with respect to P, and check whether they are the same or not. But if on top of that, someone tells you that actually this is the same as change in internal energy, then you don't even have to do the test. It has to be an exact differential for this to be valid. At the same time, if you are writing du is equal to APV dp plus BPV dv and someone asks you, is this correct? Is this a possible form? And you go and do your Euler's test, you can check whether it is possible to be an example of du, that you can have a du that looks like this. Because you expect du to be a total differential, so it must follow Euler's test. So, we have talked about heat and work. I showed you it's randomized motion versus organized motion. We spoke about potential energy and we spoke about the connection between them, that the change in potential energy is the change in heat plus the work done on the system. There is something which is super important to describe here carefully, which is that, and I'm gonna write it in red because it's so important, that in du is equal to and this thing changes from book to book. That's what makes it super annoying. 
here delta Q is heat supplied. Ah, I missed my supply. Heat supplied to the system. Okay, you could also write down a delta Q where it is the heat taken out of the system and some books do that and that changes the sign. Are those supposed to be partial derivatives on the right side of the equation? They are not partial derivative. On this one over here, these are not partial derivative. I'm just trying to denote them as inexact derivatives. If it was partial derivative, I would have used this symbol, right? So I'm not using that one, I'm using this one. This is partial, this is inexact these two either of these two it's a bit uh, similar looking but you know, get the idea so this is always heat supplied to the system some books talk about first law of thermodynamics as with heat extracted from the system in that case how will it look like you will have du is equal to minus delta q right and you will you will see it online or in some books don't don't get all confused as to have I wasted my life learning the wrong sort of thermodynamics? No, it's, it's, all, it's all about sign convention. Similarly, delta W is work done on the system. It is not work done by the system. So you can see why it intuitively makes sense. You're compressing the system, you're doing work on the system, its internal energy is going to go up. You are giving heat to the system, its internal energy is going to go up. So this convention is super, super important that it is to and on. It is not by the system. It is not work. It is not heat supplied by from the system. It is not work done by the system. It's to and on. Super important to keep in mind. So I want to spend. So next time we are going to look about different types of work, which is really important because you could be having a chemical reaction with pressure volume work. You could have some uh, work happening due to change of matter. You could have work happening due to just moving up and down in gravity. There will be different sorts of work and we will talk about all of that. But right now I want to take a bit of time to talk about where does internal energy really come from? So we said that internal energy is the total kinetic plus potential energy of the system. Where does it come from? It comes from movement of the atoms. So so a bit more on U. That's what we're doing here. Where does internal energy come from? <clears throat> it is the energy associated with the modes of movement. So U is associated with modes of movement or these are also called degrees of freedom of a system. What does that mean? It means you could have some translational modes, you could have some vibrational modes, you could have some rotational modes, right? If you have a gas made up of only atoms, then it's going to be only translational modes, right? But instead, if your gas was made up of diatoms, that can also stretch and expand, you would have vibrational modes by this movement, and you could have rotational modes depending on how they are oriented, things like that, right? So you could have more and more degrees of freedom. In the kinetic model, we saw that every degree of freedom in the kinetic model, we saw that every, I'm going to use DOF for degree of freedom, every degree of freedom contributes half KT of energy, right? Remember, we derived this for the kinetic model. So this leads to, this is what is called the equipartition theorem, right? This is the equipartition theorem. What does this mean for our internal energy? If you have n degrees of freedom, therefore u must be n by 2 kT. If you assume kinetic model. 
that's kind of boring internal energy, right? That is really boring because I was just talking about that internal energy can depend on pressure, volume, temperature, number. What's the dependence on pressure and volume of the internal energy over here? Nothing, right? It doesn't depend on pressure. It doesn't depend on volume. So we have some sort of, what does it say in the vibrational? It says rotational. So <clears throat> we have some sort of trouble here. So what we just said is that with n degree of freedom under kinetic model, u is equal to n by 2 kt. This looks fine. This looks innocuous. It looks harmless, but it leads to huge trouble. Why? Because this is telling us that u is proportional to temperature for a fixed number, right? And some of you, I hope all of you in GenChem must have seen the notion of a heat capacity, right? Remember heat capacity? It is the capacity for heat. Heat capacity at constant volume is rigorously defined as the partial of internal energy by partial temperature at constant volume. If this puzzles you as to why is heat and capacity defined that way, we will be talking a lot about it later. But this is definition, three bars means definition. So if I calculate partial u by partial t at constant t using this expression, what will be the answer? Nk by two, right? It's t independent. So if you use the kinetic model for internal energy and you try to calculate the heat capacity, k is the Boltzmann constant, Mabruk. Yes, k is the Boltzmann constant over here. That comes from the equipartition theorem. So refer to the kinetic model that we did last time. So if on this basis, I try to plot my heat capacity versus temperature, how would it look like? It would look like a flat, boring line, constant. It's even got a name. It's called Dulong Petit Law. Until quantum, the reason I'm showing you this is because this is one of the first triumphs of quantum mechanics. In early 20th century, People had no idea. This is clearly wrong. Most materials do not have a constant heat capacity. At zero temperature, heat capacity goes to zero. At zero temperature, heat capacity actually looks like this, then it rises. And then at very high temperature, it tends to become like this. So this is a real heat capacity. And people had no idea how to get this. They would go through this classical model and they would be like, oh, our heat capacity should be constant but it's simply not true. Nothing has a constant heat capacity. If you are at a finite room temperature, heat capacities depend on temperature. It could be a protein, it could be a battery, it could be anything else. In order to prove this, people had to use quantum mechanics. There was no other way to get it right. And the reason this happens is because, why, why did we lead into this trouble? We got into this trouble because we said that every degree of freedom has half kt energy, right? Problem happened due to this. This is actually true only for degrees of freedom that are square in some mode. So remember, in order to do this, we talked about kinetic energy, which was one by two mv squared. Or we could talk about some potential energy that looks like half k x squared. This is true for square type energies. Square type energies show up a lot in physics and in physical chemistry. The reason why they show up a lot is because anytime you are close to the ground state of a system, the force is zero, right? So anytime you are close to the ground state of a system, in the close to the ground state, square approximations hold true. Hold true close to ground state, close to equilibrium position, not ground state. But as you go further from equilibrium, the square approximations start to fail. And that is called, that is a direct consequence of Taylor's theorem. 
the long petit law, but if you forget the name, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Most, if you have taken any quantum mechanics, which you probably haven't, and you will take it in 482, you will learn that the square laws actually do not show up in a lot of physics. In quantum mechanics, you have bizarre distributions of energy that are not square, that are quantized. And anytime this breaks, this half kt type argument breaks, and then we can no longer derive heat capacity in this constant way, and we won't get it right. So this was advanced material, but hopefully the reason I put it right now is to get you excited about why these things matter and why quantum mechanics matters. And uh, so this was a big triumph of quantum mechanics very, very early on. We are not doing quantum mechanics in this, but you will see these things in, uh, in 482. So this is a good point to stop. We are already three minutes late. We saw first law of thermodynamics that tells us about du is equal to sum of two path functions, Q and W, which is kind of beautiful. We spent some time thinking about heat. We spent some time thinking about work. And then I really went through all of this to give you a flavor of what is internal energy. For an ideal gas, it's very easy to write. Now, keep in mind this n degrees of freedom is not always the number of atoms. If you have a diatomic gas, it's going to be different. If it's uh, in, in your next homework, you will have problems on how to calculate N for some generic system using ideal gas. We cannot really calculate this for non-ideal gas. It's going to be complicated, but I want you to keep in mind, sorry, I want to, I, I will post it online in two minutes, no else, so don't worry. And uh, for non-ideal gas, this will not hold true for real gases. And that's why for real gases, deriving it is painful, it's hard, we don't do it here, we do it in advanced classes, but it's to keep in mind that heat capacity looks constant only for ideal gases. And we will revisit this constant behavior of heat capacity along with heat capacity at constant pressure. We are going to visit these things in a bit. Next class, however, we are going to talk about different types of work. And then we will talk more carefully about reversible work and irreversible work and get to equilibrium. So it's, it's gonna be time soon that you will need some comforting from Pakora, at least some of you. Thermodynamics will pick up before you know it. It's, it's a deceptive subject. It looks very simple, but it, it really picks up gradually. And before you know it, you are in heavy abstract land. But stay with me, ask me questions on Slack. Almost entirely, I will respond the same day in the next 30 minutes but also try to help each other out. Many of you are more comfortable with the subject. Many of you are comfortable with part of the subject. Please help each other out and we will learn together. Okay, so see you Monday.